As regular viewers will no doubt know, we just recently wrapped up the Innsmouth Literary Festival 2024 in sunny Bedford. Well, actually quite a waterlogged Bedford, but that's appropriate for Innsmouth, right? Now, one of the great things about organising the ILF is, of course, I get to meet a ton of different people, artists, writers, game creators and designers. I get to sit on panels with them, we get to have good chats, and I get to do some great shopping as well. That includes t-shirts and other similar items, but mainly books. What I'm going to do today is look at two books I got at the ILF. We're going to look at Rendered Flesh by David Cartwright and Shadow of the Serpent by John Houlihan. Hi, I'm Rob Point and thanks for joining me today for this review. Now, I should just mention at the outset that I do know both of these authors personally. They've both guested on the Innsmouth Book Club podcast a couple of times and they were both guests at the ILF and appeared on a panel or two each as well. However, this is going to be an honest review. So let's start with David Cartwright and Rendered Flesh. David Cartwright was born in 1981 and raised in a golden age of Saturday morning cartoons. From that time and forever after, he has been an avid watcher and reader of fantasy and horror, encompassing the likes of the Hammer Horror catalogue and Friday the 13th, to The Walking Dead, Train to Busan and the works of Stephen King and James Herbert. Previous jobs in manufacturing have given way to writing full time, whilst his academic background includes studying in media and counselling. His credits to date encompass work in both literature and RPG. He lives in Hampshire, England with his family, his cat and his growing collection of flannel shirts. It's true, I don't think I've ever seen David without a flannel shirt. But anyway, Rendered Flesh is basically a zombie story, but with a twist. Now, I'm sure, like most of you out there, I do like a good zombie film, whether it's a classic Romero's or through to The Walking Dead and so on. However, I did think that there was no real new way to present zombies. Because, let's face it, it usually ends up with a group of people trapped in a house or some sort of place, and they're going to try and escape, uh, you know, and things generally go quite wrong. There are a few exceptions. So when I got this, I thought, right, I enjoy a, a zombie book. I know David's a good writer. Let's give it a go. And I was really pleasantly surprised to find that the approach he took was something I thought was very different, very innovative. So the story concerns three young social activists, Lex, Jay and Indy. They spend a lot of their time online in their activism. And I think we can all sympathise with that. Anyone who does that, who spends a lot of time online, particularly on social media, you can, uh, you know, you can suffer from, shall we call it, idiot fatigue <laughs> after a while. You know, there's a, let's put it this way, there's a lot of negativity around. So in order to get away from that, they escape into the world of video games. However, the technology is such at this point in time that this video game is totally immersive. Imagine sort of VR on steroids and you've got some idea. So the three of them go into this game, which is essentially a zombie survival game. However, it turns out that that game starts impinging more and more on their reality and it gets difficult to tell where the game ends and reality begins. Of course, within the game, they start encountering other players and that brings other levels of complication because, again, the actions of those people is reflected in actions in the real world as well. So far from being an escape, this game ends up really adding, a, I suppose, a, a new level of stress and nightmare to their situation. Now, having said that, then you do still get all the good old zombie stuff, of course. You get people creeping along corridors. You get the scenes of uh, deserted highways with cars full of bodies or perhaps child zombies, you know, reaching out from under the cars. All that good stuff is in there as well. But there's a couple of things that made it stand out for me. One, 
is that central idea of your inner virtual reality that is impinging on your real actual reality. That to me gives it that weird or cosmic fiction touch that lifts it out of just straightforward horror or body horror. So that was really nice. The other thing is the characters. They're very well written, very well developed, and you accept them as real people. Because I sometimes find in horror films and zombie films, you know, you might have your main character, two main characters perhaps, then the rest, <laughs> they're pretty much red jerseys, right? You think, yeah, he's going to get killed, she's going to get eaten, he's going to fall down the hole. They're just really there to provide those moments of horror. In this, you've got very nicely rounded and developed characters that you, you, you learn more about as you go on as well. So that was a real strong point. Now, that's not to say there's no gore or violence, of course, because there is. This is a zombie novel, after all. So David doesn't shy away from uh, writing about that in detail, which is fitting to the subject, of course. So you have that suspense element of creeping about, trying not to be discovered. You've got that weird element, uh, uh, is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? And you've also got the full-on horror element in there with, you know, people are taking bites out of people. As I mentioned at the start, these three people are social activists and David certainly puts forward a lot of political views in it. That's part of who the characters are. Personally, I have no problem with that at all. I think it all works very well. It all fits very nicely, but I am aware, <laughs> mostly from being online and Facebook, that not everyone likes that sort of thing, you know. But that's up to you. For me, for me, as I say, it fits the characters perfectly, and it just rounds it out. It gives it that extra dimension. These aren't just your generic, flat, zombie survivalist characters. So, overall, an excellent read. I think the last zombie book I enjoyed this much was probably World War Z, or World War Z. And uh, yeah, this really has become a favourite and I would love to see this developed into a, a TV show or a film. My only dislike, if I can put it that way, of the book is that it ended and I want to know more. I want to know what happens next. So I think David might be at work on a sequel. Let's hope so. So on to our second book, Shadow of the Serpent by John Houlihan. John Houlihan is a novelist and short story writer publishing over 10 books, including The Seraph Chronicles and the Mon Dieu Cthulhu series, The Cricket Dictionary and the BSFA Award nominated The Constellation of Alarion. He has also appeared in numerous sci-fi and fantasy short story collections. He currently works for Modifius Entertainment as an Emmy Award winning game designer, creative lead and narrative director and works for many other RPG companies, including Wizards of the Coast, Need Games, a monolith. He worked for the Times, Sunday Times and Crick Info and is the former editor-in-chief of computerandvideogames.com. Away from the written word, he has an unnatural fondness for cricket, football, snowboarding, cycling, music, playing guitar and all forms of sci-fi fantasy and horror. He has an unnatural dread about writing about himself in the third person and currently lives in his hometown of Watford in the UK because, well, frankly, someone has to. Yeah, and just reading John's bio there has reminded me that both of these guys have also contributed to some of my own anthologies, including the latest one, When Shadows Creep, which is Lovecraftian stories set in London. OK, so Shadow of the Serpent. This has literally just come out in the last few weeks, this book, so it's very new. And it's the third in the Mon Dieu Cthulhu series. Now, I have read the first two. I don't think you particularly need to have read the first two in order to, to get this book but of course I would advise you do so anyway because <laughs> they're jolly good reads. We're in Napoleonic times. Shadow of the Serpent is set in Spain 1810 or in the middle of the Peninsular War. This was France under Napoleon versus Portugal, Spain and the British. Now our hero for this series is the dashing hussar Gaston Dubois and in this volume, for various reasons, he's been kicked out of the Hussars and is demoted to the Dragoons. In fact, to a, a particularly ramshackle unit of Dragoons. So part of the story is about him making this shift 
from uh, this elite unit into this, well, what would you call them? Uh, slack, I suppose. They've, they've got poor commanders. They've got poor kit. It's a big step down socially and militarily for our main character. That's the backdrop. And I have to say, for me, historically, this all feels very real and very accurate. Uh, I don't know if John has been around horses or is a horse rider, but I get the feeling that he has. Obviously, these are cavalry units, so there's very nice detail about the horses, about all the kit, about how the units are trained, for example, because Dubois puts his new unit through uh, his hussar training, basically, to try and whip them into shape. So you get all that nice detail and background, which again, like our previous book, really fleshes out the character. Alongside that, of course, or creeping underneath, we have the mythos element. In this case, it really starts with Dubois having a duel with a fellow officer that goes, well, very weird and very strange. I'm not going to say much more than that. Though Shadow of the Serpent will, of course, <laughs> give you some idea. If you're into weird fiction, you might get some clues from that. Uh, so we have that weird thread running through it. And also, he's up against a guerrilla leader called La Espina. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Who may also be involved in the same sort of activities as the guy he fought the duel with. So we have that running through. And of course, uh, from what I gather, I mean, there were some pitch battles and sieges, but the Peninsula War was very much a guerrilla war as well. So that comes across with the Dragoons going out on patrols and coming up against the local Spanish freedom fighters. So yeah, a lot of good historical information. This put me in mind, I suppose people are going to make the inevitable comparison with Sharp, right? This is like Sharp from the French perspective, with added mythos. And, you know, I don't think it gets much better than that. <laughs> Again, very nicely drawn and developed characters. And I also like the way this is presented as well, because this is Dubois telling you what happened. Uh, but, of course, he refers to himself in the third person quite often, uh, which I imagine a French czar would do. And that fits very nicely. It gives it this very sort of conversational tone and also, it brings out a lot of humour as well. There are quite a lot of nice asides. If you're a fan of Dumas like me and the Three Musketeers, you know, you, you enjoy those things where they're having a duel and someone tosses out a, a very nice insult, which probably hurts more than being hit with the sword. So there's a lot of that contained in this series as well. There's a few little Easter eggs, of course. There's a character called Montoya. I'll say no more than that. And fans of the mythos will spot lots of little references peppered throughout. As the narrator is French, of course, we get French words dotted in here and there, which I didn't have a problem with. I thought that added to the atmosphere nicely. The only thing I did struggle with was quite often the H's are left off. So E and ad. Oh, E ad, which I found a bit jarring, not from a... <laughs> <laughs> not from a narrative point of view or character point of view, but simply because as an editor, I do a lot of proofreading and my eye picks up spelling mistakes quite often. Unfortunately, it's much better at picking up other people's than it is my own. As any editor will tell you, you can read through something five times. As soon as you get it back in print, you spot the mistake. So that was a very minor issue. And that's just me being a, a copywriter. My only other thought was, it ended quite quickly and quite abruptly. And I want to know what happened next. But that's good writing, right? Because obviously it's pulling you through this whole series. So, yes, uh, another excellent read. And very interesting to see the Cthulhu mythos set in the Napoleonic era. I'm pretty sure there might be a, a sort of mon dieu set of rules coming out from Modiphius. Perhaps an RPG system, something like that. So. If the writing is as good as this, which I'm sure it will be, that's going to be well worth looking at. There we go then. That's the first two books in my huge pile of shopping that I've got. I'm slowly working my way through. Both excellent reads, both set in very different times and places and circumstances, but both extremely enjoyable. And of course, both authors have numerous other books out as well, as well as their RPG and gaming projects. So I'll put their links down below. 
do go and take a look. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks very much for watching. As always, please do like, share and subscribe. Send in your thoughts. If you've got any books that you think I should be reading, particularly weird fiction or mythos related, then pop me a message down below and I'll see you next time.